I want to welcome everyone here this day, whether here in sanctuary or online. As you may notice, I'm still online. Uh, Chris and I both are improving each day, and we're thankful for all the prayers and concerns as we overcome this COVID virus. But just to keep everyone safe, I'm recording my, my sermon introduction once again this week. But I hope you know that you are welcome just the way you are. My name is Mike Segerman, the pastor here at Desert Hills, and it's a joy to have you in worship, again, whether here in Sanctuary or online this day. One of the things we always do here at Desert Hills when we gather for worship is we remind ourselves and the world what we believe God is calling us to be about. So here at Desert Hills Lutheran Church, we celebrate grace, we make disciples who make a difference. May it be so among us here this day. Some announcements for the coming weeks ahead. First of all, I just want to thank all the worship assistants and Pastor Wally Moore, who will be leading communion this weekend. Thank you for Pastor Wally and all the assists. Next weekend, we have a special guest, Vicar Daniel Volkman, who is a seminarian who has been the recipient of DHLC's Foundation Scholarship. He'll be preaching here next weekend, so come and hear his message of hope and love. The American Red Cross will be holding a blood drive here at DHLC on Tuesday, October 4th, starting at 8.30 a.m. The Women's Lunch Ministry Luncheon will be held on Monday, October 10th. If you would like to purchase your tickets, you need to do so by this Wednesday, October 5th. The cost is $5. This weekend, we will be collecting our, for our food, local food bank. So if you brought food items, please place them in the northwest hallway. Also starting next weekend, the Social Concerns Ministry will be sponsoring a two-week canned food drive for the Crossroads New Gallus Mission. So please bring your canned food items for that important cause. There will be a brunch in the Fellowship Hall at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, October 19th, to meet Ann and Willie Lange, who are missionaries that we have been supporting for over the last 10 years. If you invite you to come in here and meet, there, meet them, if you're interested, we invite you to please RSVP to the church office so we get a, a sense of the numbers who will be attending. October's here, and with October brings more activity. So if you're wondering which new groups are starting up or what, which ministries are once again uh, returning for the fall, I invite you to pick one of these up as you leave the worship space today or look on our website. It tells you what's taking place each day and what activities or groups you may be wanting to be a part of. As activity begins to increase, we also need more ushers here each weekend. So if that is something that you feel called to participate in by making a difference here at DHLC, we invite you to pray about being an usher. If you're interested, we invite you to call the church office and let them know, and they'll pass your name on to the head ushers. I invite you now to join with me as we begin our worship with an opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are so grateful for this opportunity to gather, to hear your word, to be inspired by the music, to be community together. Bless us this day as we hear your word and as we celebrate with our voices lifting up. May our hearts and may our minds be transformed by your word and by your presence. And may we walk together as people of faith, supporting and caring for one another along the journey. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. I invite you now to please stand for opening him.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and that truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. <clears throat> For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in you and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <clears throat> in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord.
merciful God, when we are empty, fill us. When we are weak in faith, strengthen us. When we are cold in love, warm us. That with fervor we may love our neighbors and serve them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's first reading is from Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You, who would want to be reckoned as righteous by the law, have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. <clears throat> the only thing that counts is faith working through love. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word of the Lord.
Today's second reading is from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. My brothers and sisters, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are not, uh, excuse me, for if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all may carry their own loads. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. For the past two weeks, we have been studying the book of Galatians. And this is the final week, the third week in this study. If you were here two weeks ago, you would have heard the question, why Paul? Why is Paul the one that we should look to to understand our faith? If actually, if you look at the New Testament, most of the New Testament is actually written or credited to Paul. Paul is one who has helped us as a Christian community understand what it means to be people of faith. And Paul reminds the people in Galatia and as well as us that Paul got his sense of the gospel not by reading or talking to others. He got it from Jesus Christ himself. That Paul received a direct revelation from Jesus about what this faith means. And Paul now shares that with the churches that he starts, helping them understand what is important and what is critical in this journey of faith. We heard how there were these outsiders coming and trying to dispute what Paul was proclaiming. That Paul did get the full story, that you need to add more to what Paul says was the gospel. You had to do the works and the traditions of the Jewish faith to really be included. Paul refutes that the first week. Last week, Paul reminds us again why faith is it. Faith is it because faith is really stepping out from what was into something new. And you can't keep your life in both worlds. Paul says if you try to live by faith and works... It doesn't work. It is only if you step out from what was into what will be do you actually experience the kingdom of God. Why faith matters is because faith is the only way for us to live this new life that Christ has ushered in through his death on the cross. And now, this final week... Paul turns his attention to the question, what counts? What really matters? Paul has laid out what the gospel is, how the gospel invites and welcomes all the different communities into one family. That is, is through faith in Jesus that we become children of God. Paul tells us that faith, faith in what Jesus does frees us to live new lives. And now Paul says what this new life looks like is a life that's focused in on the cross and through the cross sees the world differently. That the cross allows us and calls us to live our lives based upon the love that God displays on the cross. One of the core values here at 
Desert Hills is that we say we all come to the foot of the cross. Where there we are all equal. But it's more than simply coming to the foot of the cross. Paul says we then must look into the world through the cross. That the cross is the lens in which we see the world. God so loved the world. That the cross helps us to have a new imagination of what this world is about. It changes our perspective. You, also, you oftentimes hear the statement, your perspective is your reality. And at one level, that's true. How you perceive the world is, in fact, your reality. But what Paul and what Jesus tells us is our perspectives needs to be shaped by this new reality that Jesus is ushering in. Not only does our perspective tell us what reality is, the reality of what God has done in Jesus on the cross needs now to shape our perspective. We need to have a transformed mind and heart. We cannot continue to look at the world the way we did. That to step out in the faith, to look at the world through the cross, is to change your percep perception of what's going on. Your perspective of the world. That our perspective is changed and challenged by the reality that God has ushered and is ushering in. That we cannot be like the world. It says, do not let your hearts and minds be Conform to the ways of the world, but to be transformed. And really, the sense of conforming is the sense of taking a mask and forming it to your face so that you look different than what you really are. This is the image of actors in Jesus' day who conform themselves to the reality of the play, not really being true to who they are. What Paul is telling us, that as people of faith, we don't conform our lives to the way of the world. We are transformed by the reality of the cross. We live differently through love. And that, Paul says, is how we know we are children of God. But we are called to line ourselves up with the Spirit... Though we ourselves cannot do it. It takes the spirit working in us. When Paul is talking about how this transformation takes place. Paul has us look at the work of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. Paul says the work of the flesh is violence and hatred, division but the fruits of the Spirit is peace, self-control, contentment. Paul says it's our work of the flesh that causes us to see the world in a certain way. But when we align ourselves with the Spirit, the Spirit works in us to produce this new fruit of self-control and patience and love and joy. It is not something that we work. It is something that we allow to happen in us as the Spirit works inside of us. As we align ourselves with this very new reality of God. Ushered and revealed in Jesus on the cross. Paul then goes on in chapter 6 to say... Now that you know this new reality, you as a community are to live differently. You are to bear with one another the struggles of life. You are supposed to lift each other up and not tear each other down. My two sons, when they were in middle school and high school, they both ran cross country. 
I don't know if you've ever gone to cross-country meet, especially in middle school and high school, you see a variety of runners. You see those runners who are elite runners. <laughs> They're running three miles faster than I can run a mile. <laughs> They're quick. They're lean. But then, as you watch the pack, you notice that there's a variety of runners. And toward the back, there are those who are just struggling to make it. And what always amazes me whenever I've been to a cross-country meet is all those elite runners who have gotten done and gotten their awards, they come back and they encourage those other runners. Those runners that won't have their names in the paper, who will never get a ribbon, they are simply out there to finish the race. They are trying hard. And all those other runners who have finished the race understand the pain of the run. They understand what it takes to run those three miles. And as each runner enters that final shoot into the finish line, people are cheering. From whatever team they're on, they're cheering each other on because they understand the struggle. It's an amazing thing. These athletes who at one point were competing each other also appreciate the endurance and pain of simply running the race. <laughs> Paul uses the image of running when Paul describes the Christian faith. And I think this is a good reminder for us as those who attempt to run this race of faith. Most of us will never show up in history books or on plaques about how great our faith was, how we made such a huge impact on the world. Most of us are simply trying to run the race. Most of us just try to put our one foot in front of the other, trying to follow Jesus the best that we can. Our impacts may not be noticed, but the race is just as real. And Paul tells us that we, like that cross-country race, should stand and support and cheer each other on because we all understand how hard it is to run the race of faith. To be a disciple of Jesus is not for the weak of heart. If you are really willing to con transform your hearts and minds to this new vision of God, you will be beaten down. You will be discouraged. But you will also be supported and loved. This image of race reminds us that we are to encourage one another along this journey of faith. But at the same time, all of us needs to run our own race. The reality of each cross-country runner, they had to get themselves across the finish line. Those other runners couldn't run out and grab them and put them on their shoulders and carry them to the end. That's not how it works. You have to run your own race. But you can sure support. You can sure encourage. You can sure lift up. That's the reality of our faith. We have a great cloud of witnesses who encourage and call us to continue the race ahead of us. But all of our journeys look different. And all of us must take this journey alone. As Christ calls us and leads us forward. It is always the both and in faith. We love and encourage one another, but we also understand that we can't do it for them. 
that we must take up our own cross and follow Jesus into the world. That we need to have our own hearts and minds transformed and renewed by the very power and grace of God. We all need our own perspectives transformed. It's simply not enough for me to rely on you. I need, I need to be renewed. I need to be born anew each day. I need to die to my old ways of seeing the world and be reminded and be renewed to see the world differently. And that's a, day, that's a race I make every day. That's a decision as I align myself to this power of the Spirit and this call of, of Christ to believe this new reality that's breaking in despite all that is around me. I will run the race. We'll run it together. <laughs> Encouraging, uplifting, praying, but yet we will run it as individuals. We'll run it with our own hearts and minds being renewed by the witness and the call of Jesus and one another. We do it by looking at the world through the reality of the cross. Where God's love is revealed the most intently. Where God's love for me is shown. And where a new reality has been born. For the kingdom of God is breaking in. And as people of faith, we trust that, we look for it, we see it, we hear it, we believe it, we live it. Because in so doing, the fruits of the spirits are born within us. We, need, we live new, transformed lives under the hope and grace of God. So if you would like to dig a little deeper today, here's what I invite you to think about. How have you experienced the love of God through the community of faith? How has that community helped you take that next step along your race of faith? And to know that you're not alone. You have a crowd of witnesses encouraging you and supporting you along the journey. May we run it together, sisters and brothers, lifting each other up, bearing with one another. But may our hearts and minds be transformed by the renewing of, of our spirits to the reality of the cross. And may we live into this new kingdom that's bursting all around us. Amen.
together, let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The psalmist is written in Psalm 133. How wonderful it is, how pleasant for God's people to live together in harmony. It is like the precious anointing oil running down from Aaron's head and beard, down to the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, falling on the hills of Zion. That is where the Lord has promised his blessing, life that never ends. Pray with me. Lord, we continue to offer our thanks, prayers, and gifts of time, talent, and treasure for your mission in the world to bring good news, help, and hope for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. New to our prayer list are Pastor Ron Glusenkamp, Wayne Blake, Shirley Gerard, Norm Bistel, Gary Cording, Trudy Hunt, Pastor Mike Sager, and Kristen Sager. Leaving the prayer list with thanksgiving for healing is Phil Carter. We take time now to silently pray for those who remain on our prayer list, as well as for others in our hearts and for situations in our lives. To all in need of healing, Lord, grant peace, comfort, and hope. Reassure those who are despairing and accompany all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that we may grow in grace and live our life as you would have us live, in spirit and in truth. Help us to be kind, compassionate, hospitable, and gracious toward our sisters and brothers in Christ. May we love one another in the same way that Christ has loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you accompany those who are most in need. Give strength to those affected by the devastation caused by Hurricane Ian and to all who are in parts of the world ravaged by natural disaster. Bless those who bring them rescue and relief, including Lutheran disaster response and the first responders providing aid and assistance. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we praise you for the gift of the church and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus. Be with Pastor Craig Larson and his wife Suzanne as they prepare to join us in ministry, and with the congregation and staff of Mount Zion Lutheran Church during their time of transition. Lord, in your mercy, sustaining God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine. Feed and reassure those who are hungry and rain down the true bread from heaven that gives life 
to the world. Lord, in your mercy, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we entrust our prayers into your hands. Gracious Father, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, we begin this holy moment of communion in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a pastor and as also as a member of this congregation, um, I have often instituted communion and received it in the pew. And whenever I have done this, I prepared myself for communion by remembering the time when it began. You remember the story. Jesus on Monday, Thursday, knew that this was going to be his very last meal with his beloved disciples. And he knew that the following day he would be executed. And when he was no longer alive, his disciples would be discouraged. They would feel abandoned. They would feel alone. And they would be struggling with all that Jesus had taught them. So Jesus, on their behalf, gave them a small ritual. We call it the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So that when they gathered together and they broke the bread and they shared the cup, they would know that he was still with them. And so the church gathered week after week and after a meal they would share the elements of communion, the bread and the wine. And they discovered something along the way, that when they shared this blessed communion, not only did they feel the presence of Jesus in their midst, but as they received the communion, there was a change. And Jesus came alive in their hearts. Martin Luther later took this experience of the living Jesus and called it the real presence of Jesus in these elements. It is not just a meal of memory. It is a meal of new life. Will you please stand and join me in the words of institution? Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner also, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The love and mercy of God in the bread and the blood of Jesus Christ. Shall we join together and pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us? 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And remember that this table is open to all who follow Jesus. And remember also Jesus' words to his disciple as we come forward. Remember what he said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come now and see how good the Lord is. And now may our hearts and our minds be transformed by the promise of new life in Christ. As we gather even 2,000 years, we know that Jesus is with us and within us. We know that God loves and forgives us and strengthens us. So we go in peace, proclaiming that love to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
When we follow Christ, we take up his journey, moving forward together. May we all say, I will follow you wherever you go. Amen.